Thank you. I think Ambassador Klim did a fantastic job of explaining what NATO is doing in uh, Romania and in, in the region. But let me also, maybe I'll cover some of the same ground, but let me also talk a little bit more about how we do it. But before I do that, I'd like to, of course, thank the organizers of the Bucharest Forum. I'd like to thank the entire team at the Aspen Institute and, of course, the German Marshall Fund for uh, organizing this event and, <clears throat> and inviting me to participate. And it's a great honor to be here and to follow, of course, Minister Fifor and Ambassador Klim, who I would say is one of our most highly respected uh, professional career diplomats, uh, members of the Foreign Service. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be in Romania, a committed <clears throat> NATO ally, which contributes to the alliance in very, very many ways, including through its support to our missions in Afghanistan and Kosovo, and by hosting the multinational framework brigade that Ambassador Klim referred to. <clears throat> Today, I'd, I'd like to share some thoughts with you about the role NATO plays in preserving peace and promoting stability. Now, as you know, NATO is now an alliance of 29 member states with the recent uh, arrival of Montenegro at the council table. And we are an alliance united by shared values of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. And our dedication to peace com comes explicitly from NATO's founding treaty, the Washington Treaty, signed in 1949. And in that document, allies committed themselves to safeguarding the freedom, common heritage, and civilization of their peoples, and to uniting their efforts for collective defense and for the preservation of peace and security. Now, I, I was delighted to see this uh, standard here behind me when I arrived uh, the, from the NATO headquarters. And uh, it says at the uh, bottom, through uh, partnership and cooperation, NATO has preserved the peace for nearly 70 years. And in fact, 68 years, the purpose of NATO has remained exactly the same. The alliance exists to preserve peace. And we do this by promising to defend one another in accordance with Article 5 of our treaty, all for one and one for all. And this pledge has helped us to preserve peace in Europe for 70 years, nearly 70 years, one of the longest periods of peace and stability in Europe's turbulent history. But while NATO's core mission has remained unchanged, I think the reason NATO has been successful is that it has evolved in the way it carries out this mission as the security environment itself evolves. Today we face the biggest security challenges in a generation, including most significantly, as Ambassador Klim pointed out, a more assertive Russia and instability in the Middle East and North Africa. Let me discuss these challenges in turn. Russia is NATO's largest neighbor. NATO does not seek confrontation with Russia. In fact, after the Cold War, we worked hard to forge a strategic partnership with Russia. But Russia's aggressive behavior has undermined trust, stability, and security in Europe. In 2014, Russia illegally annexed Crimea, and Russia continues to destabilize eastern Ukraine. For the first time since World War II, for the first time since World War II, one European nation has taken the territory of another by force, dramatically changing our security environment. NATO has a two-track approach to Russia, defense and dialogue. No one should doubt the readiness and the resolve of NATO to defend its allies. That is what deterrence and preserving the peace is all about. Since 2014, the NATO alliance has significantly reinforced its collective defense, not to provoke conflict, but to prevent a conflict. NATO's four multinational battle groups in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland are now fully operational. This sends a clear message that an attack against any ally will be met by the alliance as a whole. NATO, as you know, as you've heard, is also strengthening its multinational presence here in the Black Sea region, in the air, at sea, and on the land. This presence is based around a Romanian-led multinational framework brigade. Eight allies have committed to provide brigade staff, and five have committed land and air forces for training and air policing. Now, let me emphasize that all of our measures are defensive, and I think there's some key words here 
they are transparent, proportionate, and in keeping with our international obligations. At the same time, however, NATO continues to seek a more constructive and predictable relationship with what Russia and to encourage Russia to once more act within the rules of the international community. Transparency and predictability are critical, especially when tensions are high. The risk of unintended consequences or incidents or accidents increases when there are more military forces and more exercises along our borders. We have to do everything we can to prevent mistakes or miscalculations from happening. And if they do happen, to make sure that they don't spiral out of control. So despite our differences, we continue to engage in political dialogue with Russia. Now the other major challenge the alliance faces comes from the violent instability to the south, instability that, that has forced millions of people to flee their own countries, and which I know has had an impact here in, in Romania as elsewhere, and which at the same time has helped to breed extremism and has inspired acts of terrorism. Many of our cities and citizens have suffered these terrorist attacks, but in our free and open societies, it's very difficult to prevent them. We can't just close down our cities, but nor should we accept terrorism as the new normal or allow our values and our free societies to be undermined. If we stand by our values, if we're resilient and determined, strong and united, then we will prevail against this threat as we have against others. We have already made significant progress. Thanks to our military, police, and intelligence services, there have been no more attacks of the scale and complexity of the 9-11 attacks in the United States. Al-Qaeda is diminished, and ISIS has lost most of the territory it once held in Iraq and Syria. The threat is still there, however, and there is much more we need to do. Together, we have many tools available to us, and we must use them all. We need to fight radicalization at home. We need our police and intelligence services to investigate and protect. We need political, diplomatic, and economic efforts to bring an end to conflict and to negotiate and sustain peace. <clears throat> and we need the military to counter and defeat groups like ISIS. In this collective endeavor, NATO cannot do everything, but it has an important role to play because tackling the root causes of terrorism and instability is not only about what we do at home, but also what we do beyond our borders. That is why NATO remains committed to preventing Afghanistan from again becoming a safe haven for terrorists. Our work in Afghanistan remains a truly international effort. 39 allies and partners are working with the Afghans to help them make their country more secure and to prevent it from ever again becoming a safe haven for international terrorists. Over the years, we have achieved hard-won gains in Afghanistan, and many of our troops have paid the ultimate price. The situation remains challenging, but today Afghan security forces are fully responsible for security across the country. Every day, they demonstrate the bravery, resilience, leading the fight to defeat terrorists and protect the Afghan people. Afghanistan is key to NATO's contribution to the fight against terrorism, but we are contributing in many other ways as well. NATO is training Iraqi officers so that they are more effective in the fight against ISIS. We're increasing our support for partners in the Middle East and North Africa with a range of training and defense programs with partners including Tunisia and Jordan. This is important because if our neighbors are more stable, we are more secure. Here, NATO can play a crucial role, building on decades of experience and partnerships with more than 50 nations and organizations around the world. It's only by working together that we can make real and lasting progress. Let me also point out that NATO is now a full-fledged member of the global coalition to defeat ISIS, and we've stepped up the contribution of our AWACS surveillance planes, which give the coalition a much better air picture. We're also working to improve our awareness and the way we share information so that allies can take swift preventive actions against the threats we face, including terrorism. This is one of the main purposes of our new intelligence division at NATO and the new hub for the South that we're setting up at the Joint Force Command in Naples. And we're also working much more closely with the European Union, including in tackling terrorism. 
In fact, closer cooperation between NATO and the EU has rightly become a strategic priority at the NATO headquarters on a whole range of issues. In the past year, we've made a step change in our cooperation, and we're now implementing a range of concrete measures to improve how we work together. On hybrid, we're taking steps to increase situational awareness and to bolster our nation's resilience to attacks. In fact, a few days ago, uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg and uh, the EU High Representative Mogherini visited Helsinki for the inauguration of the new Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats. The new Center of Excellence will help nations and international organizations like NATO and the EU to better understand modern complex threats and to strengthen our societies against them. When it comes to maritime security, NATO's Operation Sea Guardian and the EU's Operation Sophia continue to cooperate in the Mediterranean through logistical support and information sharing. On cyber, we will strengthen our mutual participation in exercises and foster new research. Indeed, the recent increase we've seen in cyber attacks underlines the importance of strengthening our cyber defenses, which is exactly what we are doing, strengthening the cyber defenses of NATO's own networks, but also helping NATO allies to strengthen their cyber defenses. We exercise more, we share best practices and technology, and we, are, we also work more and more closely with all allies looking into how we can integrate their capabilities. And I'm pleased to say that uh, this effort at the NATO headquarters has been led by my colleague, my Romanian colleague, Assistant Secretary General uh, Ducaru. The final issue I want to address today is uh, defense spending. Uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg, and uh, as you heard earlier, he'll be here on Monday for the, uh, along with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, uh, has made it a priority to encourage allies to spend more on defense and therefore foster fairer burden sharing. The good news is that after years of decline, in 2015, we saw a real increase in defense spending across European allies and Canada. In 2016, this continued, and in 2017, we foresee an even greater annual real increase of 4.3%. That represents three consecutive years of accelerating defense spending. This means over the last three years, European allies and Canada spent almost 46 billion US dollars more on defense. Last year, five allies met NATO's benchmark of spending 2% of gross domestic product on defense. But this year, Romania has joined them. And in 2018, Latvia and Lithuania expect to do the same. So we've really shifted gears, and the trend is up, and we intend to keep it up. So let me sum up simply. For the last 68 years, the purpose of NATO has remained the same, to preserve peace. But in the face of new and evolving security challenges, the Alliance has adapted and will continue to adapt to fulfill this core mission. In an uncertain world, NATO exists to protect almost one billion citizens, and this is a responsibility that we will always fulfill. Thank you.